Khan and welcome to our Friday seminar. We are delighted to have with us as our speaker today, one of our very own, uh, Dr. Abra Sarkar from UT Austin. Abra is currently an assistant professor there at the Department of Statistics and Data Science. And he received his PhD right from this very department, where he was advised jointly by Ray and, and Bonnie. And he also completed a postdoc after that with David Johnson at you uh, before joining UT as an assistant professor. He truly has varied and diverse research interests across methodology and applications. The list is so long that even I couldn't remember all of it. So, my, among his many interests, a few specific ones include uh, longitudinal data models, uh, measurement error problems hidden Markov models, Gaussian graphical models, and Bayesian non-parameter And he's also interested in applications in nutritional epidemiology and neuroscience. And needless to say that he has done lots of good work in all these areas. And today he's going to tell us about some of his interesting recent work on drift diffusion models for category learning. So please join me in welcoming Opera. Well, thank you, Abhishek. Everybody can hear me? Hello, back. Okay. Um, of course, very excited to be back. I slightly changed the title. Uh, it has become a little longer. Bayesian semi-parametric local inference and longitudinal drift division models uh, for tone learning in adults and some related problems. Uh, when I talk about related problems, I really mean problems, not the solutions, because I don't think I would have the time. After covering the first part, I don't think I would have the time to, to discuss the solutions. Uh, so the talk is structured in these uh, different parts. So first, I'm going to talk about local inference in longitudinal functional mixed models in very general settings. Then I'm going to talk about their adaptation in uh, longitudinal drift division inverse Gaussian mixed models. Then I'm going to talk about an extension or adaptation of that to inverse probit mixed models. And then finally, uh, not finally, uh, uh, simultaneously, I would also talk about uh, interesting applications in auditory neuroscience problems that motivated the, the, the second two uh, uh, thrusts. And then finally, like I said, i discuss some problems, not the solutions, just the problems. Um, so part one. So here is the, the setting. It's a very general setting. We have a continuous response variable Y varying longitudinally over time. And then we have an associated categorical predictor X, which may or may not vary with time. And then uh, we call this locally varying because the levels of X may affect Y very differently in different longitudinal stages. So this is how we are gonna model this process. So you have Y, I, L, T, I for the subject, L for the replication and T for the time point. And then we have associated X, I, L, T taking the value X. And then we have a fixed FX functional component, FXT, a random FX component, UIT, and then random errors. Uh, when I, again, talk about uh, local inference, so locally varying models, so here is a synthetic example. So here we have uh, capital T equals to 20 time points, and we have the mean profile of Y evolving very organically over time. We have an associated categorical predictor X that takes three different values. For the first five time points, all three different values of X, they have the same influence on Y, no differential uh, effect. But then starting at time point five, the effect of one and three separates out from the effect of the level two. And then at time point 10, the effect of one and three, again, separate out, branch out. And then at time point 15, the effect of one and, uh, effect of one and two, they march back together. So very, very flexible, very organic settings, right? How do we do that? So we, we do that by modeling these functional components, uh, FXT and UIT, both using flexible mixtures of B-splines. So here, BKTs are the, the B-spline uh, components, and then beta KXs are the associated B-spline coefficients. So the B-splines, they are all shared for different values of X, but then the coefficients depend on the value of X, right? The coefficients are indexed by X. So, uh, and then we do the same thing basically for the random effects, UITs, mixtures of flexible B splines. And then uh, this is the random effect distribution. I'm gonna come back to that again uh, in a few more slides. Now, if we define the problem, like if you, if you uh, define a model in this way, 
we can now cluster the curves simply by clustering the spline coefficients, right? Because the spline uh, bases are shared. So if beta k x for two different values of x, they take all the same values, then the corresponding functions are all clustered. That's a very simple idea. But what's interesting is that because B splines have local support, so if you look at this figure, this is the first B spline and then it becomes zero. This is the second B spline, then it becomes zero. So they have local support that also allows us to cluster the functions locally. So here's an idea where we have again uh, two curves corresponding to two different values of x, x equals to one and x equals to two. Here, the, the associated values of the betas, they are the same throughout. So that means that the two functions are the same, the entire range. But then here we have a set, we have a different example where the first three coefficients, beta one and beta two, beta one again spline coefficients associated with x equals to one, beta two spline coefficients associated with x equals to two. The first three coefficients are the same value, but then they're different. So the effect that has on the on the implied function is this. So for the first part, the functions are the same, and then the, the separate of it. So really very simple idea. Uh, and then uh, how do we do that? We can do this type of, we can induce this type of clustering by introducing latent variables. Um, so here, gkx for each value of the categorical predictor x, it's a latent variable, and k is just a not location, the b splines. And then if gkx takes the value zk, then beta kx takes the value uh, beta k star zk. That's the idea. And then uh, because we are looking at longitudinal data, we have time dependence. Uh, we have further allowed the zk's, we have further allowed the zk's to, to, to depend on the previous uh, value zk minus one. Um, so on the left-hand side, the figure here, that's the traditional HMM. What we have here is the functional HMM, I think we called it in the paper where you are modeling not the, the, the data points directly, but this is swine coefficients using an HMM. And for each categorical predictor, each value of the categorical predictor X, you have one HMM. And then uh, conditional on the values of these ZKs, we induce smoothness in the associated swine coefficients. Uh, the, the, the equations here look very complicated, but the idea is very simple. So here we have an example on the left-hand side where at the time point, at time point six, the, the black function has diverged into two. So these two children nodes, these two children coefficients, the, the orange coefficient and the blue coefficients, they are now centered around the black one. The opposite has happened here. At time point 15, the two functions are much back together. So the black, the black coefficient now is centered around his parents, the orange coefficient and the blue coefficient. Yes. The last slide, it's a classic of Python's lab or is the functional type of Python's lab? Rare set up, last, last one. This one? Yes, yeah. This is a Python's lab rare. Um, not really. There is no continuous component or anything like that here. All we are saying is that when the latent variable zkx takes the value zk, the coefficient takes the value, the atom beta k star. There's no notion of a uh, a spike and a separate continuous lab here. Okay. Uh, anyway, so it's a very simple idea here. Uh, the, the, the children are always centered around the parents. Um, and here we have again the, the, the random effects, uh, the random effects curves. So this beta UI is the random effects coefficients. They have now this random effects distribution. As opposed to traditional random effects models, we have two variants. Uh, parameters here, sigma us squared and sigma us squared. One of them controls the smoothness, the other one controls the distance from the, 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 the mean line zero. For example, if you look at the figure, sigma, this one is showing the effect of sigma us squared. You can see that if sigma us squared is large, then you have more variability around zero. And then likewise, if sigma us squared is small, you have more smoothness, large, uh, more weakly and so on. So these are some, these are the results basically. So you can see the black line, the, the, that's, the, uh, that's the true underlying functions that we showed uh, on the second slide. And then uh, on top of that, we have the estimated mean function and the associated 90%, I think, uh, credible regions, point-wise credible regions. The whole procedure is fully automated. All we have to do, uh, all we have to, 
give to the algorithm as input at the values of the y's and the x's and the time points where they are measured. So no additional information is needed about where the function is branching, where they are marching back, et cetera. So the algorithm automatically figure out, figures out all this information. Yes. So, uh, so there's a lot more exercises to follow, right? Because they determine which point they can Yes. Uh, so in our applications, all our applications, I think in the paper, we have six different applications. Uh, the data points, they are all observed at equidistant points. So the knots we chose to be at the same locations. So that way, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and then we are also showing the, 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 the individual level estimates, individual level, so if X, T plus U, I, T, uh, it's difficult to tell which one is which. I think the solid line is the truth. And then we have the dashed line, which is the estimated function, and then associated 90% credible intervals. Again, we have excellent fit. Uh, we have like, the focus of the paper that I'm talking about is actually the multivariate extension, which is an order of magnitude more difficult problem. So it's very similar idea. Uh, so you have here, instead of having a single x, we have x1, x2, xp. So the piece plan coefficients are now again indexed by x1, x2, xp. And then for each predictor xj, we have a latent variable gjk xj given gjk xj equals to gjk, and it's a typo here, I should have included that information. But then again, uh, basically we say that beta k for this predictor com combination takes this arrow as its value. Now, uh, this, this thing that's going on here, it can also be viewed through the lens of tensor factorization. So basically what we have at each not location or each time point, a large coefficient tensor, beta one, beta two, all the way up to beta k for k naught points. And then at each naught location, we are data adaptively factorizing this coefficient tensor into a smaller core tensor and uh, factor matrices. Now, this is, to my knowledge, very different from traditional continuous tensor factorization because in traditional continuous tensor factorization, usually the original, if the original tensor is continuous, all these components are also continuous. Here, only the core tensor is continuous, but these mode matrices are basically this level. So they are all categorical variables. So in that sense, I think this was very novel. Um, in the original univariate setting, we had a single HMM for each level of X. Now we have a collection of predictors. So we have uh, like different layers. So these types of HMMs in the literature are called factorial HMM. Here we have, Again, a synthetic illustrative example. So in this example, we have 10 different predictors. The first two, predict, all categorical, the first two predictors take two different values and the, the last seven take uh, three different values. So the total number of parameters in a completely unstructured model is gonna be this. And only two are important, X1 and X3. Again, for the first five point, time points, you see there's no effect of any predictors. But then starting at time point five, the, the two predictors X1 and X3, they are now locally important. They are not globally important because for the first five time points, no predictors are important. But the, the influence is very complicated. Uh, the influence, the joint influence of X1 and X3. We, here, what we are showing here is actually not just the, the, the true functions, which are again shown in black, but also the fitted, fitted curves. And you can see how good the, the fit is. Again, everything is fully organic. All you give the, the algorithm is just the values of the y's, the x's, and the time points at which those are observed. Now, this is joint work. I'm not gonna talk about, for the rest of the talk, the multivariate extension is not gonna be that important. Only the, the notion from the first part, we inhibited uh, categorical predictor is gonna be important. So I'm not gonna talk about real data applications here. This is joint work with uh, Giorgio Paolo, my first PhD student, and Professor Peter Muller, my colleague. Um, um, I don't do this in our departments, but I was kind of tempted to include this slide here. So I first actually conceptualized this idea when I was a student here at ENM. I actually had given a, a talk, uh, like a presentation in Professor Carroll's uh, reading research group. And I don't have the original tech files, but I still have the slides, the PDF slides. And so here you see again, I'm trying to basically do dynamic video selection using factorial HMM. At the time, I didn't know anything about tensors. So I was doing all of this uh, in dynamic linear 
uh, model settings. But then I learned about tensors later and I was able to refine the idea and make it hopefully much better. Uh, I was tempted to mention this, but also careful not to send any incorrect message to the graduate students. Uh, I just got busy with like, as a graduate student with other projects, I just didn't have the time to work on that project. It wasn't like I was procrastinating. Uh, that concludes the first part of the talk. The second part. So uh, I joined uh, UT back in 2017 and started this collaboration with a with the brilliant neuroscientist there. I'll talk about him. And then uh, he had a bunch of problems where that basically forced me or motivated me to again go back and look at this idea. So here's his, his experimental settings. He is an auditory neuroscientist and he's interested in categorical learning. So being an auditory neuroscientist, category learning for him is uh, speech category learning. And then in their lab, they do it by studying how speakers of non-tonal language learn to speak, learn to identify rather uh, non-native tones from tonal languages. So what is a tonal language? A tonal language is a language like Mandarin Chinese where the same word, if spoken differently, if pronounced differently, carry different lexical meanings. English on the other hand is not a tonal language. So uh, in their lab, they study this uh, four syllables all sounding like ma, I mean, Chinese speakers in the audience can immediately relate. And depending on how they are pronounced, uh, they have these four different meanings. This is how the experiment look like. So in each trial, they ask the participants that they give an input. And the participants uh, have uh, headphones and everything on and they listen one of the, to one of those tones. And then they're asked like, which category do you think that was? And then they have to give an answer. And then at the end, they're given corrective feedback. Like, yes, you were right, or no, you were wrong. So we, we and they do this over several days in several training blocks. So on the right hand side, if you look at the little table, the T here, uh, denotes uh, the training block. And then I is for the individual, L is for trial again, uh, within each training block. And then S here stands for the input stimulus. So in the first trial, S is two, that means that the input tone was tone two. And then D here is the decision category. So D here is one, that means tone two was incorrectly identified as tone one. In the second trial, the input tone was tone uh, three, and then the output tone or the response tone was also tone three. So in this case, it was correctly identified as tone three. And then on the right-hand column, extreme right-hand column, you have tau, which is uh, the associated response times in seconds. So the first decision was taken in 1.2 seconds, the second one's 0.9 seconds and so on. So, and, and they did it with 20 different non-native speakers from the Austin area. Uh, and they did it over two, uh, they did it over 20 uh, days but we are gonna look on the first two days here because the first two days are the most important. And for the first two days, we had a total of five plus five, 10 blocks. So what you see here is the, the accuracy of different individuals and also the group specific average, the group specific average accuracy. So the different uh, panels, they correspond to different input tones. So this entire panel is for input tone one. And then within each panel, the output tones are also uh, denoted here by unique colors. So red output tone is always, the tone one is always, uh, sorry, tone one is always uh, shown as red. So within uh, this panel, you can see that the input tone was red and the output tone was like this curve is the accuracy of the output tone. Uh, accuracy of that input tone being correctly identified as red. And you can see that over time, over training, the accuracy has generally increased as you would expect. And then if you look at the, this red curve here, here the input tone was tone two. And over time, people are incorrectly identifying it as red tone or tone one with less and less uh, frequencies. So the figure is clear. And then on top of that, we also have the associated response times, right? So we are not showing here the, the individual specific response times because those profiles are too noisy, very highly variable. So these only show again, the, the group specific, like all 20 individuals averaged out average uh, response times over time. And the, the goal here is to again understand how these different stimuli affect the perceptual mechanism at different longitudinal stages uh, as the participants become more experienced and more proficient in this task.
Uh, so one very popular class of models that people use to do this is strip diffusion model. Um, so if you look at new imaging data, new spike chain data for this type of experiments, you'll see that the, the, the firing of the neurons, once a stimulus is presented, the neurons start firing rapidly, and then after a while, the activity suddenly stops. So the way neuroscientists interpret that is that the brain, when the, when the neurons are firing, the brain is collecting evidence in favor of different possible alternatives. And when the activity is suddenly has stopped, it means that the brain has now made a decision. So the brain is no longer you know, using any energy or time uh, to, to, to make, you know, to arrive at a decision. So one way you can computationally model that is using drift diffusion models. So here evidence is accumulated over time via a drift diffusion process denoted here as W tau. And a decision is made when an evidence threshold is reached by the process. Uh, so here in the figure, we are showing an example. It's a classical example. The classical literature is very, very heavily focused on the two category example. And then usually they would assume there is one single latent process and two evidence boundaries on two sides of the origin. If you can see if the process moves to the, to the, to the red line and crosses the red line first, that means that the decision is the right decision. And the time that it takes to, to, to reach that boundary, again, is the associated response time. For example, in this particular trial that's going on, you see the decision was a blue decision, right? Because the, the process first crossed the blue line, and then we have the associated response time on the, on the x-axis. Um, this is, this I think is very, very cool. Uh, but the problem of doing it this way is that the response time distribution in this, in this types of models is very, very complicated. Uh, I don't have any examples, mathematical examples here, but many people have written on this. The, the actual, uh, actual distribution of the response categories and the response times is just very, very complicated. If you want to build on that, if you want to build complicated longitudinal models, mixed models, et cetera, it's just, it's a very difficult task. Also remember we have four different tones. So we have four different decision categories, right? This is a very simple example where we have two different response categories, one single process. So if we are modeling a uh, four dimensional process, we have to, using this idea, we have to consider one latent process moving sort of like in a four dimensional region. Mathematically super complicated. So, uh, what we can do instead is we can look at what are called race models. So race models assume that for each possible alternative, you have a separate latent process. Uh, so here for the red decision alternative and the blue decision alternative, you have two different latent processes, each racing toward the boundaries. And again, we have the same idea, the process that reaches the boundary first, corresponds to the decision that is made and the time that is taken to reach the decision is the decision time. Um, the literature is still very, very limited very, very heavily focused on simple binary choice models, very simple static designs, low longitudinal, anything like that, and very simple fixed effects only models, no way to accommodate subject specific heterogeneity. Again, if you remember our example, we have four different categories, so it's a multi-category example. We have a longitudinal design, people are learning to do these things over several days. We have also significant subject specific heterogeneity. You remember the, 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 the graph where I was showing the, sub, the subject specific accuracies as well as the average group specific accuracies and the, the variability in the, uh, in the response times is in fact so huge, I didn't even show that. So there's very large subject specific heterogeneity and this is important to the, to the neuroscientists. They wanna know the difference between a good learner and bad learner. Like why some people are very good to pick up these things very quickly and some people struggle. Additionally, it's also very important to understand the local differences between the processes. This is where, again, that problem of local inference, where you allow the functions correspond to different possible alternatives to vary very organically over time, again, comes into play. Why is this very relevant here? Because if you think about it, when the first time that the English speakers are introduced to these different possible alternatives, the brain has no idea what it's doing, right? So initially, you wouldn't expect the underlying processes to be any different those differences would only emerge as a process of learning itself. So later, when the people are very accurately identifying the four possible choices, then you would expect that the underlying processes are gonna be different. Um, so this is the reason why I, was, I, was, I felt motivated to go back to, to those old ideas and work on them. Uh, we are, uh, for our particular example, again, we have four different tones. So we have a race model with four different latent processes. 
here we are showing a particular instance, a particular trial where uh, the input tone was tone one. And then we have four different uh, processes running to, toward the boundaries. The boundaries are shown here. And you can see that the red process has reached its corresponding boundary first. So this means in this particular trial, the red tone, the red input tone was actually correctly identified in the end. And this is the associated response time. We have one additional uh, variable here, delta, that's uh, called uh, an offset in the literature. Uh, it's basically collects all other times, like the time it takes to button press, to record a response, et cetera, et cetera, that are not directly related to the actual decision-making process. Yes. Just a quick question. So all of these latent processes are the underlying processes for that particular person to reach the, like the decision yes. for the corresponding category. But then there is also the gold standard truth for like what exactly was that, uh, you know, this is like the, that person's answer. Right? That person's so, answer in this particular trial. Okay. And then, and then we have 40 trials at, within each training block for each individual. Okay. So this process is being repeated that many times. But then there is also a correct answer, right, for that question. The person may or may not be correct. Yeah, so in this case, yes. In this case, we see that the red process reached its boundary first. So that means that the person actually correctly identified the, the tone, input tone. If instead, let's say this purple uh, process had reached its boundary, where is it? I, I think at the top. If instead, these are all random Brownian motions. So if, if this guy, this uh, process had reached this boundary first, that would mean that the response is a uh, purple response, tone three, I think. So that means the input tone was tone one. That means in this case, that tone was incorrectly identified as tone three in this particular trial. Um, does, does it have a meaning, like the height of the Yeah, yeah. Uh, so delta, I think I already, I'm coming to that. So delta, I, I already, all the parameters here, that's the, that's the nice thing about it. Like the reason why drift diffusion models are so popular in this field is that all the parameters you can actually biologically interpret. So delta S, I said that that's a parameter, that's the time that's not related, directly related to the actual decision-making process. And then we have two other parameters, uh, mu, like shown here, that's the drift parameter. Uh, that represents the firing rates of the neurons. So if the drift parameter is large, that means the neurons are firing more rapidly. And then we have these boundaries. We have these boundaries. Those are the evidence results, right? That's how much information you really need in favor of different possible alternatives to come to a decision. So all three parameters are biologically uh, meaningful. Now, one nice thing about this race model, uh, one nice thing about this race model is that uh, the, the, the distribution of the, of the response time, the distribution, uh, the time tau d to reach the dth response boundary under the SF input stimulus, it has a close form distribution. We didn't derive it, it's already existed in the literature and it's inverse Gaussian with this PDF, right? So that means uh, if we assume simultaneous accumulation of evidence for all decision categories by independent winner processes, this figure that we discussed, that means that the joint distribution of D, the final decision category and the associated response time would look like this. This G is the same as this. So all we are saying here is that you observe this category and then these ones are the ones that you didn't observe. So that means that the response times for these must be greater than the observed tau. So it's one minus the CDF. So you have the PDF for the observed decision category and then product of one minus CDF for all unobserved categories. So it's a very simple construction. And then again, you see, basically again, we are showing a situation, a synthetic situation with input tone one. So we have uh, all these different processes running for many different trials. So if you look at the distribution of the response times when this input tone was correctly identified, this is the distribution. When the input tone is incorrectly identified as let's say tone, uh, I believe this is tone three, if, if, if the input tone is incorrectly identified as tone three, the, the distribution of the associated response times, it's still inverse Gaussian, but it now has this set and so on, okay? Very cool. Um, here's another instance of the same thing. Now, by now we have actually all the elements, all the components that we need to construct a likelihood function for our complicated longitudinal uh, design. So you have, we have, 20 individuals 
t equals to 10 blocks, 10 time points. Again, we are looking at the first two days, five plus five, 10 blocks. And then we have 40 trials within each block. And then these are the parameters and these are the observed data. So this is our likelihood function, just conditionally independent given all the parameters. And you have this indicator function that says that my input tone is tone S and then my output decision is decision D. Um, how do you model then these parameters? All these parameters now see they are, they are functional parameters except delta SI. Again, we have biological reasons not to allow this guy to evolve over time, but the drifts and the boundaries, they are evolving over time. So as people are learning, the amount of information that need to uh, arrive at different decisions, uh, that's your BDS, that's allowed to vary over time. And then also the, the firing rates of the neurons, that's also allowed to vary over time, right? So now we are back to basically the setting that I discussed in the first part of the talk. We have this underlying parameters, mu x t. You see all these parameters here that are indexed by D and S, right? And D uh, has four categories, tone one, tone two, tone three, tone four. S has four categories. So the combination has D comma S. That combination has 16 different possibilities, right? Um, so if you define your X to be this combination D comma S, we have now, uh, we are trying to now model a functional parameter just like what we had shown in the first part of the talk, right? We had fxt there, now we have mu xt. And likewise, you would have bxt and so on. Um, yes? So, like, can we get the inverse Gaussian distribution as from the distribution theory for hitting times of the yeah. linear process? Is there an exact result or there are No, that's an exact result. Um, Where was I? Uh, yeah, so we are talking about how we would be modeling these parameters, right? So now we would be using ideas from the first part of the talk. Uh, we have this exponent function just because this, uh, we have this exponent here just because these parameters, the drifts and the boundaries are always non-negative. But then we are back to the setting that we, we were in in the first part of the talk, right? We had a fixed FX components and then a random FX components. We model the fixed FX components using mixtures of these points. We model the random hertz components, again, mixture, so B splines. We'd, we'd make one small change. Um, so basically, if, if A is equals to D, if the decision is correct and the decision is incorrect, we expect the random hertz to be on the opposite side of the average. So that's basically all this ensures. But other than that, it's the same idea. So we are modeling, we are modeling the fixed surface components and the random hertz components using flexible mixtures of locally supported B splines, uh, both for the drift parameters mu as well as the boundary parameters v. And then you can integrate out uh, these random effects to arrive at sort of like an average uh, effect uh, for both mu and v. Yes. So could you describe in words about your parameters, for example, in, in, in the context of uh, pond learning, for example, like mu? Yeah, so mu, mu ds uh, right here. So mu ds, this is the drift parameter for individual i in training block t when the input tone was tone s and the output for a trial when the input tone was tone s and the output tone was tone d. So drift means uh, how fast you can learn that. Yes, drift means how, how rapidly the, the neurons are firing in the brain. And then this is likewise bds, Individual I, training block T, input tone S, output tone D. How much information does the brain need to arrive at that decision? That's the interpretation of this parameter. Okay. Uh, when you see the pattern, don't call it cluster, it still means the time partition. The partition, the time equal to different blocks and mean each block into the uh, in each block, block, block you do a different partition. Yeah. That's one way to look at it, yes. So uh, these are the results. So here we are looking at the longitudinal evolution of the drift parameters. Uh, again, I mean, I don't have the time to discuss the, the computation. The computation proceeded via local informating humming brawl samplers, um, but mixing everything was, was fine. Nobody's there. So uh, this is the, the longitudinal evolution of the drift parameters over time. So you can see that this is how the drift parameters are evolving for correct decisions. And this is how the drift parameters are evolving over incorrect decisions in each panel. 
And then these are the devolution of the boundary parameters. Uh, this is very interesting, especially these two, these two panels. And this was very novel information to our collaborators as well. So here you see that uh, this is tone three. So when the input tone is tone one, tone one and tone three, they are usually the, the easiest to identify. So when the input tone is tone one, the brain needs a lot more evidence in favor of tone three to misidentify it as tone three. The same thing is also happening for tone one. I mean, sorry, tone three. So when the input tone is tone three, the brain needs a lot more evidence against it and in favor of tone one to misclassify it as tone one. Uh, we also have co clustering probabilities at different longitudinal stages, the 10 blocks. Now, what do you expect? We would expect, again, we said that tone one and tone three are the most similar and easiest to identify. Tone two and tone four, we'd expect them to be in a different block. These are the co clustering probabilities, and we see that after a while, that's exactly what we're seeing here tone one and tone three. For the success uh, parameters, they are clustered together. And uh, for tone two and tone four, the similar thing is happening. Now for the first few blocks, we don't expect them to be clustered. We don't, ex we expect them all to be clustered together, right? Because there is no difference between different underlying processes. And that's kind of what's happening here, except this little block. We don't have any explanation for that. It's, it's curious, it's what the data said. It shouldn't be there, but for whatever reasons, it is there. But other than that, if you ignore this, the pattern is very consistent with what we expect. Initially, everything would be clustered together and then differences apparently are emerging. Really strong differences are starting to emerge, uh, starting with block four. Um, these are, I said that individual specific information, individual specific inference in this case is very important. So here we are showing uh, drift parameters, mu, for two learners the best learner of the lot and the worst learner of the lot, like the person who did really, really well versus the person who really struggled. And you can again see the difference between the two. I and mean, this type of inference is not possible using other existing methods. Uh, this was again joint work with Giorgio. Uh, the problem was first introduced to me by Fernando. And this is the, the this, this funny looking guy is the is my collaborator, Professor Varish Chandrasekhar. Uh, Fernando used to be in his in his lab working as a postdoc back then, uh, but he's now my colleague in the linguistics department at UT. Uh, the paper was published in JASA. It's also available on archive. Uh, this brings to the third part of the talk. Um, so we saw that if we have data in these types of experiments, data on both response times and response categories, uh, we can fit a drift division model, very sophisticated one, using our method and do lots of cool stuff. But there are many situations where uh, you don't get to observe the, the, the response times. Uh, one example is when the experiments are conducted online, and you have no idea, like someone sitting at some other part of the United States is hitting a button, but you don't have any idea exactly what time. See, you have a good record of the actual response decision, but not the response time, because of all the delays and other uncertainties, right? And then you, you may have participants in clinical experiments with motor deficits because they record their, remember they record their uh, response by button press, right? So people may be just slow in pressing a button. And then uh, the particular motivating experiment, motivating data set that we worked with, they are also measuring pupillometry. Uh, why pupillometry? Because apparently in behavioral neuroscience, it's a well-established result that pupillometry gives very good, pupillometry is a very good indicator of the underlying cognitive load. So how much overall effort the brain is having to put in the particular task. Now, the problem is if you are pressing a button to record your response, that also affects pupillometry. So ideally you'd want the pupillometry, pupillometry measurements to only relate to the decision-making processes, not the button press. So in this particular experiment, our collaborators, they, had, they basically asked the participants to delay their response by approximately four minutes. So that means that the response times were basically useless. So you had to deal with only with uh, the, 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 the actual decision uh, responses. Now the question is, how do you fit a drift division model when you have data on responses alone? Is it even possible? And uh, I mentioned, uh, when I first started discussing drift division model, there is a substantial literature on those classical drift division models in binary settings and simple settings and all that. 
This is a very important problem, but there's exactly zero paper that we know of that exists in the literature. Um, so we have a paper uh, where we showed that, um, well, first of all, note that we already derived that the joint distribution using the rest model, the joint distribution of the response time and the response category looks like this, where this small g is the, is the PDF of inverse Gaussian distribution. And this is the cumulative CDF. Uh, this is the CDF of a, of a inverse Gaussian distribution, right? Uh, so that, that implies that the marginal probability of observing a decision D for each trial is obtained simply by integrating out this tau from this expression. So this is the joint PDF of D and tau. If you integrate out tau, you would arrive at the marginal probability of just observing D. So in our first experiment, when we had data on D and tau, this was the individual likelihood building blocks right, for each trial. Now we don't have data on response times. So that means this would be my individual building blocks. Pretty straightforward in that sense. So in our paper, we call this model the inverse probit model because it's kind of similar to traditional inverse. Uh, it's kind of similar to traditional multinomial logit, multinomial probit models except that instead of having a latent extreme value distributed random variables and looking at the maximum or a latent multivariate normal distributed random variables and looking at their maximum, now we have latent inverse Gaussian distributed random variables and we are looking at their minimum, right? We are looking at, we are looking at the process that has caused the, the corresponding decision threshold first. So you're looking at the minimum. That's the reason why we called it a fancy name. We thought that would help sell the paper. Um, and then we prove this result in the, that uh, in the absence of data on response times, delta S, the, the, uh, the, uh, the time that the, that the brain takes basically to, to do everything else not directly related to, to the decision process, it's no longer identifiable. So we just set it to zero. And then we prove that mean DS and BDS are also not separately identifiable. So you can either do inference on mu or do inference on b. Furthermore, if we focus on mu, why do you focus on mu? Again, if you go back to this figure, this figure, if you look at this two, which one is the, is the more important driver of learning? We think it's the, it's the drift because it's the drift that, you know, the, the difference in the drifts is, the, is, the, is very prominent in later stages of learning. But if you look at the, the boundaries, in this case, in this case, especially, they're all pretty similar, right? So that's the reason why we decided to focus on mu and not on, not on the boundaries. It's also from this figure, I uh, forgot to mention, if you look at this, the, 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 the y-axis range, it's all approximately between 1.5 and 2.5. So that's the reason when we fix the values of b, we fix them at two. It's the best that you can do. I mean, you can't identify them separately. So what do you do? You just fix them at a plausible value. And the plausible value for us, based on the prior analysis, is two. But then you still need at least one more restriction to uniquely identify the mu's, right? So how do you do that? The problem is like, if you think about traditional way of doing this, using traditional uh, multinomial logic model, multinomial probit model, you just choose a reference category and you fix the, the, the coefficient corresponding to this reference category as say one, and then you focus on the others, right? We can't do that here. Why? Because again, look, this is our data, right? I mean, and within each panel, you have different, within each panel, you have different mu's that we are interested in. If I fix within each panel, let's say the, the success category as my reference. So whenever D is equals to S, I'm going to use that category as my reference category within each panel. Uh, then basically I'm assuming something like this. If I assume something like this, I'm assuming that mu SS here is one, mu SS here is one, mu SS here is one. So I'm automatically also assuming that they are all clustered together because they all take the value one, right? The probabilities are still gonna be different, but if you look at the, the actual parameters, you are assuming that they all take the same value. It, our collaborators, they don't care about the probabilities. They have the, the empirical probabilities and they, they, they care about the underlying news. So how do you do that? So you cannot use reference category. Instead, what we did was we, we imposed a symmetric constraint. So we are not setting 
any specific value to any of these parameters. And then we did the clustering subject to this constant. Um, and this was implemented via a novel projection based approach. Uh, this was a very hard problem for, for me, at least personally. Uh, the, 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 um, the identifiability issues, et cetera, that they were pretty clear in the beginning, but then I had some intuition that a projection based approach might work here, but I was struggling with the details. So that's when I, I sought help of my former classmate and good friend Minerva, who is now uh, an assistant professor at IIT Kanpur. I don't know if we have any student here from IIT Kanpur. And then she is mathematically very gifted and she just solved the problem for me. Um, so there we are, the manuscript is available on archive. Um, this is joint work again with that funny looking guy and his uh, PhD student. Uh, oh, by the way, I can make these comments because my relationship with him is, is, is really nice. Um, <laughs> and then Joyce is a PhD student in his lab who did all these experiments and helped us understand the problem and all that. Minerva is mathematically very gifted, but clearly not very good at finding good pictures of her. I asked her to send me a good picture that I can use in my talk and she sent me this one with a random dude in the background. <laughs> He's not part of the team. Uh, so this was, this is available on archive. We're very excited about this paper, like I said. I mean, I only spent like, I think three or four slides on this problem, but if you look at the paper on archive, it's a very substantial paper. Uh, and like I said, the, the first paper, the division, uh, some substantial literature on that, not on longitudinal mixed models, et cetera. And, and that was a very significant progress, we think. Uh, but on this problem, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, and then the first paper was uh, very well received. We have submitted it to JASA and very swiftly accepted. One of the reviewers like, this is the best JASA ICS paper I've ever reviewed, blah, blah. Uh, we also won Michel Prize 2020 with that paper. It's sort of like the best Bayesian applied paper in that year. With this paper, it's a different story. Um, I know this thing is being recorded, so I cannot say no more. Uh, but um, the, the paper, the first rejection came in back in January, and uh, this is September. I still haven't gotten over that. Um, so now I'm, I'm almost done. I'm going to wrap up. Uh, well within time, it looks like. So I thought about this slide because I know that I have already discussed three different ideas, three related problems, but three different substantial statistics papers. Um, but I still decided to do it for two, three different reasons. One, I thought that there would be at least one person in the audience who would be interested to know what I'm doing these days since I graduated. So I did it in his honor. Uh, and then also I wanted to acknowledge this guy. Uh, so the right hand column is all, all Dr. Chandrasekhar. The middle column, that's uh, his two. I have worked with other people, including Jesse, uh, that you saw. But Fernando was his postdoc, now my colleague. And then Kevin is a postdoc in his lab now. And then this column, uh, they are my group. I'm going to come to them uh, in, a man, in a moment. Uh, so when I joined UT, I wanted to build a collaboration in neuroscience. I reached out to many different people, not everything worked out. I had a funny experience one when I met with a PI and she said, you look like a high school student. You don't look like a, I thought she was giving me a compliment, but I was never able to get another, another appointment with her. Um, but then Dr. Chandrasekhar was very, very different. I mean, I emailed him and within 30 seconds he replied and uh, I visited his lab the next day. He has since moved to University of Pittsburgh, but uh, he was at UT back then. I, I went to his lab and he immediately got me involved with everything that was going on in his lab, introduced me to his graduate student, et cetera. And then for two years after that, when he was here, I used to visit their lab two, three times every week. Um, and then over the last, I was saying that my uh, application areas have become very diverse. One reason is because of this guy. So the last four, uh, I, we have been doing this collaboration, very intense collaboration over the last four years. And as a statistician or as an affiliate statistician, he has really pushed me very, very hard. Now, these five areas that, that I have listed here, I'm still pursuing some old ideas on measurement error problems. Then I have a separate area, hidden marker models, et cetera. But these are five areas that I have ventured basically uh, during tenure track, ventured fresh. 
and um, all along because like I said, this guy pushed me. So my initial strategy was, I'm gonna to try to avoid working on neuroimaging problems. I'm gonna just focus on behavioral neuroscience problems because there are all our large well-established labs working on those problems. Let's not get you know in competition with them. But then after a while, you, you tell your collaborator, well, I don't do those stuff. Find another statistician to collaborate with, which doesn't sound good. So that's why I, I was supposed to. So all these three papers are motivated by neuroimaging experiments, very cool imaging experiments in his lab. The first two, drift division models I just talked about, and there's another area, multidimensional scaling. So these three areas, at least I had heard of these areas. Like, you know, generally speaking, what people do in these areas. For the first two, I had no clue. When they first introduced me to these areas, Fernando was the guy. Uh, Fernando, would, because I'm a statistician, Fernando would just assume that I know everything about statistics. So he would like, after I have been working on these drift division models, I am uh, stuck with this problem. What do you think? I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, let, let's just uh, have a chat and see. So that's how this problem uh, basically came about. And once I sat with him, I just got hooked to the beauty of the problem. I mean, we have had a very dry theoretical stochastic process classes back in India and some here as well. But then I've never seen such cool application of stochastic processes in solving a neuroscience problem like that. So I got immediately hooked to that problem. I had to do something about it. Anyway, the same way multidimensional scaling, vector order stream model, graphical model. So all these areas are new, but I think over the last four or five years, we have been able to bring fresh new ideas, new perspectives to each of these problems, each of these areas. Again, thanks to this wonderful group of people. I made a bad joke earlier. I don't know if graduate students here got offended. Graduate students procrastinating a lot, not this lot, not these people. So Giorgio was my first PhD student, a wonderful PhD student. I couldn't, could not have hoped for a better first PhD student. Giovanni is a postdoc with us. Jin Jin is a PhD student. Noirit uh, just joined you to Dallas as an assistant professor, was a postdoc with us. And then Blake is a PhD student who just joined last week. Uh, I'm gonna, again, I have discussed quite a bit, uh, but I'm gonna have just one more slide to talk about this problem. Again, only the problem, not the solution. And I'm doing this because Jin Jin is uh, visiting uh, ANM next month for the IAMCS conference. So again, the problem originated uh, in a meeting with Dr. Chandra Sekharan. So we were having coffee on campus and he was like, oh, bro, I, I, I wanna look at uh, Granger causal brain networks. What do you think? Uh, again, my response was, yeah, sounds very interesting, but what the heck is it? And then uh, he said, well, you this, this thing that people do using vector order regressive processes, et cetera. Well, I say, well, that sounds familiar. Uh, I have never worked on this, but I may be able to do something, let's see. So he put me in touch with, with Kevin and Kevin sent me this data set and sure enough, I mean, he, he duped me. I mean, it's not an easy problem. So Kevin sent me a, 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 a neuroimaging data set with 200 ROIs and he wanted to fit a higher order vector order process and he also had 20 subjects. Now the vector order literature, if you look at it, it's very substantive, very extensive. And there are some papers that also talk about high dimensional vector order processes. But if you look at those papers, the actual applications, is 20 to 50 at max dimensional problems. So here we have a 20, 200 dimensional problems. A 200, here we have a 200 dimensional problem. A equals to four initial lag. We have to select the lags. We don't know which lags are important. 20 subjects. So if you calculate the, the, the number of parameters in a completely saturated model, it's 32 million. So I went back to him. I said that you fooled me again. It's not an easy problem. I think I have an idea that might work here, but you need to give me two years to work out the details. But then, this is a hard problem. But then I had the great luck of uh, finding a wonderful PhD student, Jin Jin Fan, and I asked Jin Jin if she would be interested, and she was. And she worked out all the details and solved the problem less, in less than two years. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about the solution. I just wanted to advertise her talk or her poster, I believe. Uh, again, in all these areas, we, publication will, will see, uh, we have not always had good luck, but in all those areas, if you look at the papers, which are all available on archive, except this one, we are still working on this. Uh, in the simulation studies, et cetera, we have some simple simulations where we have compared with other methods as you do in six papers, right? But when we are doing uh, the real analysis, in all these papers, we almost, exclusively focused on the new method that we designed because nothing else would have worked. 
on the data. So no exception here as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about the solution, except that uh, the performance is really excellent in very difficult simulation settings. Our recovery of the underlying Granger causal brain network uh, is perfect or near perfect. Um, I was acknowledging different people, so I must also acknowledge my department, I guess, at this point. Uh, this type of research, I guess, in most other departments would be very risky for a tenure track assistant professor for obvious reasons, but my department has always been very, very supportive of this type of high risk, uh, you know, pursuing this type of high risk problems. I mentioned Dr. Muller, uh, he has been very kind to me. Uh, the, the five people, of the five people here, three of them were actually shared with him, Giorgio and then the two postdocs. He, uh, he's a big name and he, he, he attracts good talent. He could have simply hired his own two postdocs. Uh, I mean, he could have had his own postdoc and I could have hired separately instead of that. We hired jointly, so that gave me the opportunity to work with two wonderful postdocs. I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, talking about department, etc., we have a tenure track position available uh, next year. Um, they hired a uh, Camu statistics graduate before, so they might do it again. I don't know. Um, I'm not on the uh, I'm not on a committee, anything or anything. But if anyone wants to talk about the department, the university. Uh, the city of Austin, etc. Happy to do it, and I know two of my colleagues are actually also hiring postdocs this year. So if anybody is interested, uh, I know that was a lot. Thanks for being with me, and I don't know if Judith is still here. Thank, big thanks to Judith for for organizing all this. program was a very nice and entertaining talk. Uh, we have two minutes for some questions. If there are, if you... so for your main talk, I was wondering what if the phone is flat? Uh, because I was thinking in your talk, and might be pretty sensitive, might be pretty sensitive to the uh, to the to the, to the time scale of the circle of parameter. So if the phone is flat, I guess the true circle would be kind of close to zero with your inference in the area and stable. When you say that tone is flat, you mean that the inverse Gaussian distribution is flat? No, I mean the just Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, the true, we, we don't see that in our data. It's one easy answer to that. And uh, because in all our experiments, uh, the, the, the response times are not infinite. So that we know from that, that the underlying drift parameters and boundary parameters, they are not widely varying parameters. And also, uh, if you set mu to be equal to zero, I believe you run into the problem that uh, the underlying processes, they are no longer almost surely convergent, meaning that th 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 there is a positive probability is gonna continue forever. So we are not allowing for that possibility with the uh, with the constant that the mu and the drift they are strictly positive here, so we are not allowing for the possibility that. But this is a very plausible assumption based on the data. Uh, are there any other questions? Welcome. I, I, I guess maybe explain again why in the first setting you laid out the boundaries and drifts are separable, like, like separately identifiable. Because I. I, I can understand the, for the inverse, uh, Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I understand the idea that uh, uh, in this latent setting, they represent you know boundaries and how fast uh -huh. uh, the process drifts toward the boundary. But I, I, I guess in terms of evidence that the brain is accumulating, I really don't know what that means. Uh -huh. And uh, especially since what people are exposed to is, I suppose, a consistent set of signals. Right? So, I, what, what exactly does that boundary represent? And, and how do you, why is that separate from the rate in which the approach is Yeah, so the boundary represents the, the amount of information you need in favor of different decision alternatives to arrive at a decision. So in this, so um, the way, yeah, so let me see. I'm, I'm not in your sample, I'll try. So when the brain is presented with a stimulus, let's say rate tone, or tone one in our case, you have four different possibilities, right? It can be tone one, in which case you'd be correct. And there are three different ways of you know being incorrect, tone two, tone three, tone four. Apparently what the brain is doing, 
using uh, this mechanism where it's firing uh, a population of local neurons, it's collecting evidence in favor of these four different possible alternatives. And then it reaches a stage where it has sufficient information to now make a decision. It's no longer uncertain about what's happening. So this boundary parameter, it represents that amount of information that the brain needs to be confident that me, I know what is, what's going on. Does it make any sense? So it's called evidence threshold in the literature because of that. It's the amount of evidence you need in favor of a decision alternative to arrive at that decision. I guess I would need to read more because I, I like in terms of once the component is presented, I don't understand where evidence comes from at that point, like how that conceptualized as building up uh, as something that's like. Oh, know? that happens due to, I, I, I guess, due to the, the local memory. So the brain. So these uh, response times are in seconds or sometimes even milliseconds. So the, it's very quick. It's not like we have presented you uh, with a stimulus and we'll be asking you tomorrow, what do you think? It's just very quick, right? So the brain, remember, like that's another reason we have a separate paper where they're comparing working memory, uh, how working memory affects the drift diffusion parameters because working memory is really important. So this evidence is getting collected or I guess the, the, the signal that you heard, it's being stored in the working memory and it's it has like feedback loop that's being utilized to, to do this. Okay. okay, so I think we need to wrap up. Uh, hopefully there are no more questions. Thank you.